Come on, let's give it to Jesus tonight. He's worthy, isn't he? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise in the name of the Lord. It's a blessing to be here at Bethlehem. I appreciate each one of you and your love for the kingdom of God, for the word of God. This is an assembly that is uh, easy to preach and to teach to, coming in here as a guest minister because you have wonderful ministers and wonderful leadership in this assembly. Aren't you thankful for the leadership that God has blessed you with? Amen. Wow. Awesome. And I want to also say thank you from the bottom of my heart and our hearts uh, for the wonderful hospitality that you all have shown to us since we've been here, just the love and kindness and uh, the, the food and the comfortable home that we are staying in with my entire family. It's just, just been great, and we're so thankful uh, for that. And we've been treated like royalty, and we're so thankful for you. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse 4. Um, reading this text at the onset of a Bible study, even to the lesser discerning of you, you probably can already guess what my topic is going to be. And I think I have uh, some uh, graphics that should be uh, there for us. We'll go ahead and get those up and ready uh, for us tonight. Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse number 4. Why don't we all read it out loud together? Can we do that tonight? Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Are you ready? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That is the foundation of everything that we are tonight as God's people. We are one body that serves one God who is one Lord who has commanded one faith and commanded one baptism. And I'm thankful tonight that he has one name and it is a name above every name. Amen. God bless you tonight. You can be seated. This is a verse of scripture that to me uh, is, as I already mentioned, foundational, foundational for each one of us. As a believer, you and I need to have in our hearts and in our minds this verse of Scripture. If I could say it like this, every single day of our lives, we need to quote this Scripture. Now, you might say, well, that's just a tradition or that's just something. No, no, no. There is something powerful in reminding yourself, reminding your family, that you are believers in the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But even more than that, are you tired of battling a spirit of fear? You know, this is one thing the Bible tells us that in the last days, men's hearts shall fail them because of fear. I'm tired of seeing God's people afraid of what may come tomorrow. That's not the spirit that God has given to us. And I do believe that our greatest weapon of warfare against fear tonight is reminding the adversary that we are believers in the one God of Israel. Because this is one thing that you and every, every spirit of hell believes in. The Bible says, thou believest in one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and they tremble. Are you tired of trembling? I want to tell you tonight how you can make the adversary tremble a little bit. Remind him about the God, the one God that you serve and that you love with all of your heart, soul, and strength. 
This is a foundational part of our home. This is something that we believe in very strongly. That every day in our home we quote this verse of scripture. When we rise up, when we lie down, we talk about the oneness of God whenever we are walking along the way. In fact, I uh, have uh, done my level best to create a culture uh, in my family uh, about the oneness of God that whenever our children are born and I'm there in that hospital room, the first words that they hear daddy say is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We say it in English. We say it in Hebrew. In fact, when my little uh, Zipporah Eden was born, I quoted Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 to her in Hebrew. Then I just began to speak to her in Hebrew. We don't name our kids until they're born, until we see them, which uh, makes our family very anxious because we don't give them a name uh, until we get into that hospital room and we see them. Some people are so organized, they've got things printed with their names on it in advance. We're not that organized. Uh, we, we do it in the hospital room, and it, it makes all of our family nervous. I began to speak uh, to little Zipporah in Hebrew, asking her, What is your name, little girl? What is your name? And uh, I looked at her and gave her a name at that point. After we had just prayed Deuteronomy 6 and 4, which in Hebrew we call the Shema, because that is the first word of the verse. And I looked up at the nurses. There were a few of the nurses that had tears running down their face. They had no idea what just happened in that room. But they perceived something holy just took place in that room. Folks, this is a holy thing that you and I have a hold of. I'm talking about the oneness of God. And I do believe that the soul of every individual wants to connect back to the root of holiness which is the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe that with all of my heart. So it's midweek Bible study. We're in this series on doctrine. Last week we spoke about Pentecost. So tonight, let's ensure that everyone speaks in tongues tonight. I know how to make that happen. We're going to learn Deuteronomy 6 and 4 in Hebrew tonight. So everybody's going to speak in tongues tonight. Everybody. You're going to leave here and say, boy, at Bible study, we spoke in tongues. Everybody. Are you ready? Let's do this together. Shema. Shema. Israel. Israel. Adonai. Adonai. Eloheinu. Eloheinu. Adonai. Adonai. Echad. Echad. Very good. Now let's learn it faster. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai, Adonai Echad. Adonai Echad. All right, now let's speed it up just a little bit more. You're speaking in Hebrew. Very good. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Okay, he is. He, he. God is not the author of confusion, so let's uh, get a Tower of Babel thing going on here in a minute. Praise God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Let's go on to our next uh, slide tonight. This is our primary point of separation. We can talk about a lot of things with regards to separation, and they are all incredibly important. When we talk about holiness, when we talk about separation, these things that you hear preached and taught from this pulpit are of utmost importance. But the primary point of our separation from this world is the doctrine of the oneness of God. This is why we look back and we see Father Abraham. The scripture declares in Genesis 12 and 1, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. When God began to separate Father Abraham, it was to follow after this one God and to follow after his word. You cannot get 
more holy and more separated from the world than following after this one God. So from the very beginning, our primary point of holiness and separation was the doctrine of the oneness of God. Abraham was brought up in a world that was full of idolatry. And in fact, there's some interesting things that we read about uh, in the Talmudic, the uh, rabbinical resources, rabbinical commentaries, which are valuable to look at from a commentary perspective that declares some of the history that we actually don't read in the scripture, but were written down historically, uh, kind of as just as a commentary or companion to the scripture. This is one of the reasons why uh, it's these very same uh, documents and same books is where we get the names of Janice and Jambres. We don't get the names. We, we read about it. Paul wrote about Janice and Jambres when he wrote to Timothy. Who's Janice and Jambres? They were the names of the magicians of Pharaoh. We don't get their names in the book of Exodus. Where do we get them? We get them from the old rabbinical commentaries, which are, were in existence even in pre-Messianic times. So there's some interesting value and, and com commentary value to these points. And when we begin to read about uh, Father Abraham, it actually tells us that his father, Terah, was a seller of idols. So they had a shop that they actually sold idols in, and one day Terah had gone out uh, for business and left Abraham, his son, back watching the idol shop. And there was a patron that came in to buy an idol one day and actually uh, asked, uh, began to ask Abraham, so what does this idol do and what does this idol do? And Abraham said, these idols can't do anything for you. Abraham was frustrated with how his family was making their living. He said, these idols are nothing. They can do nothing for you. And Abraham got so angry about this man coming in and what his family was trying to do that he took a club and began to break all of these stone idols. And he put, except for the biggest one, and then he put that club into the hands of the biggest idol. And when his father got back, his father said, Abraham, what happened? Abraham said, oh, it was awful. The, the big idol got angry at the smaller idols, and he just took all their heads off, just killed all of them. And Terah said, but no, these are just idols of stone. That's impossible. They couldn't do that. He said, well, Father, if these idols cannot protect themselves, why do we pray to them for protection. And it was in the midst of that kind of chaos that God looked down at Abraham and said, here's one that I can use. Here's one that's willing to take a stand for the truth. Church family, God is still looking for someone who's ready to clear out the idols and take a stand for truth. So we are called to be holy and to be separate. And the doctrine of the oneness is the primary way that we do that. Every other way is incredibly important. When we read about holiness and separation in the scripture, we must pay close attention to those points as well. But we start with the oneness of God. God has said in his word, be ye holy for I am holy. Amen. All right, let's go on to our next slide tonight. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here. Let's learn a little bit uh, more Hebrew. Can we do that? Elohim. This is an interesting term. Most of everyone in this room have probably heard this term before. In fact, the first time this is the word for God that is used many times in the Scripture. And it's interesting because... Most of the time, we read over this, and, and we, we read about Elohim, we sing about Elohim, and most of the time, people don't know exactly what this Hebrew word is all about. But there will come a time, if I could tell you this, in your preaching, in your teaching, in your soul winning, whatever it is that you do in the kingdom, that someone is going to ask you about this word. Because you're going to be teaching the oneness, and they're going to point you out to Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 1. 
The first time that we have the word God in the scripture is the word Elohim. And they will point out to you that the word Elohim is a plural word. So what do we say about this word? It is true. Any word that you see ending in, and I've got it transliterated for us in English, Elohim. Any time that you see anything ending with an I-M in Hebrew, that's like equivalent to an S for us, okay? For, for you and I in English, that's what makes the word plural. One example to help you kind of download it into your hard head or your hard drive, your brain. That's what I meant to say, teasing is we all know the word cherubim. It's actually not cherubim, it's cherubim in Hebrew. There's no ch sound in Hebrew. Cherubim, we know as an angel. Well, actually, that word means angels. The word cherub actually means angel in singular. So that will maybe help you to remember the masculine. This is the masculine plural form of the word Elohim, ending in the I am. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the Hebrew. So the first time the word God is mentioned, it is uh, a plural word. So let's go on to the next slide very quickly. Why is Elohim plural? Now, I'm a Hebrew teacher. I have an academy teach people biblical Hebrew from all over the world. We teach them online, and you are most welcome to join us anytime, and I will be happy to teach you biblical Hebrew. But there, if, if I could say this, and this might seem self-defeating, brothers and sisters, I, I, you don't have to know Hebrew to go to heaven. Some of you all are saying, that was a close one. If you did, or I felt like that you did, I would be preaching that everywhere that I go. You don't have to know Hebrew to go to heaven. However, if I could say this, there are some words in Hebrew that are incredibly important, I think, for every believer to know, or there may be some things that you miss. English is a very young language. It's a mix of so many different languages from around the world. It is as well in many ways, a very weak language also. And so because, and what I mean by weak is the fact that English itself uh, is missing a lot of descriptive words. And so that's why we have to borrow from so many different languages to actually get things to make sense. We've learned these words And we think many times that they are English, but they're actually not. We've borrowed them from so many words. Hebrew is a very ancient language, and it's powerful in and of itself. So powerful, uh, if I could say this, it's very similar to the chemical language. I'll give you an example. We know what O2 is. What is that? Oxygen. What is H2O? Okay, so we know that there's some, there's some hydrogen there, there's some oxygen there, and I'm not a chemist, that's not my field, Hebrew is. But biblical Hebrew is very similar. I'll give you an example that I think every one of you all can remember and grasp. It is very much like the chemical language when we look at the word Adam, which we know is the first man, Adam in Hebrew. If you separate the word Adam such as separating the A from the D-A-M, A-dam. When you separate those two, it means first blood. Well, what was Adam? He was the first blood. The first one in our bloodline. If you separate it in the middle, Adam, it means to come from the earth. That's what Adam means. Where did Adam come from? From the dust of the earth. So this is just one example of how powerful biblical Hebrew is. So when we look at this word Elohim, we need to understand one very simple rule of Hebrew grammar. Hebrew rules of grammar insist 
that singularity and plurality of any noun be dependent upon the verb of the sentence. So, when we look at the text of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the verb there is created. So singularity and plurality does not depend upon the word Elohim. It depends upon the word bara, which is the word created. Bereshis bara Elohim et. So understanding this point and knowing that this is in singular form also makes the Elohim be understood as, plur as singular. It does not matter at all if it is in plural form it becomes understood as singular because the verb makes it singular. We have a saying uh, in the field of Hebrew that the verb never tells a lie. Some words may be in plural form. Some words may be in plural form, singular, uh, 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 rather uh, masculine plural form or feminine plural form. But when you look at the verb, you will know what you're supposed to understand about the subject of the sentence or the noun of the sentence. So when we read Genesis 1 and 1, it does not mean a plural Form because the verb is in singular, it's also letting us know that the word for God, Elohim, is also singular. So the next time that one of your friends that believes in God in three, uh, in, in, uh, three persons, talking about the Holy Trinity, it is holy. The Trinity is holy, not H-O-L-Y. It's the full of holes, holy. Swiss cheese holy. That's what, that's what the doctrine of the Trinity is. It's a different kind of holy than, than our one God, holy today. And I'm not making fun. I'm just letting you know that you cannot use the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. You cannot use them to promote something that declares a plurality of persons in the Godhead when the very foundation of the Word of God in Genesis 1 and 1 declares in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. So let's go on very quickly. What about Genesis 1 and 26? Same thing. If you've ever taught a Bible study to somebody who believes in a multiplicity of persons in the Godhead, they brought you to Genesis 1 and 26. After God said, let us make man in our image. On to the next slide. I'm sorry, I forgot to give you the verbal cue there. My bad. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc. So many times we'll be pointed to this verse. What about the us and the our? The same thing when we're looking at this verse of Scripture. Um, in fact, the Bible tells us, of course, in Isaiah 44 and 24, Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, He that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth. He said, I did it by myself. He did it alone. He alone is the Creator. So some have said, well, maybe he was uh, asking uh, counsel of the angels. Well, that is uh, an interesting argument, and perhaps uh, they, that might hold some water. I don't necessarily subscribe to that, because to whom will he ask counsel? When you're omniscient, who do you ask counsel from? Who do you ask to give you an idea on how to spread the universe out by himself? The scripture says he did it by himself. Who, who do you ask? You don't ask anybody. You do it by yourself. He said, this is what I did. This was my idea. So when we look at Genesis 1 and 26 onto the next graphic, the same grammar rule applies here. The word make is our verb, and that is pronounced asa, asa. And so understanding this, this word is a word that's used in many different forms throughout the Scripture, throughout the Hebrew Bible, the First Testament or the Old Testament. The word is singular. Thus, it makes us to understand the us and the our as also singular. Church family, it is incredibly important that we understand this very simple Hebrew rule of grammar, that singularity and plurality 
of every sentence is dependent upon the verb of the sentence. When you understand that point, it equips you and it arms you, first of all, to stand on the Word of God yourself, but secondly, it allows you as well an opportunity to explain the oneness of God to someone to whom they have not yet received the power of this revelation. Now, I want to tell you something here that I uh, have already said, uh, but I want to double down on it. Your pastor and I have discussed this. It is very easy for us to sit back as apostolics and to say, hey, I go to church, I'm faithful, and all those things are great. We may say hey, we've fulfilled the, the gospel plan of salvation, and that's all great. We know how to come into the church. We know where to say amen. We know when to clap. We know when to run. We know all the right places to shout and all of those things. But I want to encourage you. We need to know the truth more or better than just know it well enough to say amen when we hear the truth. It is an old rabbinical concept one that I believe is very true that says you do not properly know a thing until you can articulate a thing. That doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. It does not mean that you have to be a good speaker. It doesn't matter if you are shy or outgoing. If you know it well enough that you can articulate it, then you know a thing. But if we are superficial in our understanding of these things, so much so that we're like, ah, I know the truth well enough that I know when to say amen, and that's it. You're going to have trouble teaching your children. You're going to have trouble explaining things to your coworkers. You're not going to be a very good soul winner and Bible study teacher, church family. These are points that we need to help equip us to win this lost and dying world. We've got to know it better than just when to say amen. We need to know it well enough that we can articulate it to someone else and help them come to terms and come to grips and come to the knowledge and understanding of so great a salvation. This is very, very important for us. So let's go on to the next slide. This is an important point for us to understand. How is it possible that there are that we all have friends that read the same Bible that you and I read, yet preach a very different Jesus. How is it possible? Well, amazingly, this is not unprecedented. The Jews of first century Judea, and even before, we can say Messianic times, and even pre-Messianic times, had a very similar kind of debacle going on, especially in Jerusalem where we had two major schools of thought that were kind of running things. Now, I want you to understand this very important point. There were many more sects of Judaism in first century Judea, but there were two that were very prevalent, and those were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Read the same Bible, read the same Torah, understood Hebrew the same, but came to very different conclusions with regards to doctrine. So let's look at a verse that most of us in this room probably have memorized. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So we find a lot of Messianic prophecies in the book of Isaiah, right? So this is very important because when we look at this, what do we see? Well, we see son is there. We see father is there. We see wonderful. We see mighty God. We see prince of peace. Yet somehow in the doctrines of today, this verse is dissected by so many denominations and doctrines and saying, He's this, but he's not that. He's this, but he's not that. How can he be father and son? You and I, we understand this point. How can he be the prince of peace, 
but also be the mighty God and the everlasting Father and the Counselor and how can He be wonderful? All of these are very, very important points with regards to Godhead theology. Well, first century Judea, the Jews as well somehow disagreed about this verse of Scripture because we have talk of a son and a father and, and all of these things. So who, who are we talking about? So I want to go on to the next slide because it's important that we understand the two main viewpoints. For the Sadducees say, Acts 23 and 8, that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Actually, the Greek word here for both actually means each. Uh, so talking about all of these three points, resurrection, angels, and spirit. Sadducees said, no, there's none of those things. There's no, there's no resurrection, there's no angels, there's no spirit. And then the Pharisees said, oh yes, all of those things exist. And so when we understand this point, it becomes a little bit clearer what's going on in the Gospels. And I want to explain this to you. When you do your Bible reading and you read through the Gospels and you hear the words of Jesus the Messiah as he's speaking to the Jews, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not, but I want you to pay attention to perhaps who it was that he was speaking to. Was it the Pharisees or the Sadducees? Because many times when Jesus was asked questions from one group or the other, he would actually answer those questions and set the record straight about what was truth and what wasn't. I'll give you an example. A woman came to Jesus, or rather, um, I'm sorry, the Sadducees came to Jesus and said there was a woman who had a husband, he died. So the Leveret marriage, she had to marry his brother, he died. Married the other brother, he died. Married the other brother, he died. And kept on going in this very vicious cycle. I can guarantee you, if that would happen in today's day, this story would be on forensic files. Come on, somebody. They'd be taking hair samples and checking for insurance policies taken out and all kinds of things. I mean, folks, this is getting deep. So the Jews asked him, in heaven, who's going to be her husband? Jesus set the record straight to these Sadducees who, mind you, don't believe in angels. He said, there's not going to be any of that in heaven, but You're going to be as the angels. You see, Jesus has a way. Instead of saying, you Sadducees are so messed up. You guys don't believe anything right. You guys have got it all wrong. Instead, he answers the question and sets the record straight that there are indeed angels. So one day, the Pharisees, and not only, now my answer would have been, now wait a minute, you're saying this woman's in heaven. She's dead. And she's burning right now she killed all those men she cyanide in the hummus in the pita bread whatever it is in the falafel that she was making for her. I don't know she didn't make it to heaven that would have been my answer but Jesus is much wiser so one day some Pharisees came to him and Jesus spoke to them and said I and my father are one next slide Genesis, uh, John chapter number 10. I and my father are one. Now, this is a powerful verse of scripture, very short, very to the point. But these Pharisees took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father, for which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So let's understand tonight what the Pharisees and Sadducees believed with regards to the Messiah. You see, they believed very differently.
The Sadducees said, no angels, no spirit, no resurrection. Pharisees said, yeah, we confess all of those things are true. They were very different with regards to who the Messiah would be. Sadducees said, when the Messiah comes, he's going to be a man. He's going to rise up like a great king or general and restore again the kingdom to Israel. No spirit, no angels, nothing. Okay, They were the deadheads, let's say. Pharisees were the super spiritual ones. They said when Messiah comes, it's going to be all spirit. The heavens are going to open. Angels will be singing. There's going to be some powerful spiritual things that are going to happen. So they believed very differently with regards to the Messiah. So here Jesus is speaking to some Pharisees and saying, I and my Father are one. They knew, those Pharisees knew exactly what he was claiming. Trinitarian people will tell you that this is not a confession of actually him saying that he was God. But that he was one with the Father, kind of like a husband and a wife are one. They're not, they're, they're still two separate but they're one, they're in unity as one, and all of this and that. Folks, that is false doctrine. When Jesus said, I and my Father are one, these Pharisees knew exactly what it was he was saying. And this is the reason why that they took up stones and they said, we're going to stone you, not because of the good works, but because of blasphemy, because that you are a man and you have here made yourself God. They knew exactly what it was that Jesus was saying. They knew exactly what it was that he was claiming. And he never said anything different to them. He let them understand it exactly as they understood it. But one thing that he corrected in them was that idea of thou being a man makest thyself God. So here it gives us the answer to the question. One said he will be all man. One said Messiah would be all spirit. Which side of the road did the Messiah come down? The left or the right? The answer is he didn't come down either side. He came straight down the middle. And it was because of this that he said, it's because of your traditions. It's because of the things that you're hung up on that you have made the word of God of none effect. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to those that believe on his name. I'm thankful tonight that I'm one of those that he's bestowed power upon. I'm thankful that I've showed my faith in his name by being baptized in Jesus' name by immersion in a watery grave. <laughs> Hallelujah. So This is important to understand context, and I want to challenge you tonight. When you read the Gospels, try to see if you can identify who it was, which sect of Jews was Jesus talking to whenever he was being asked questions and when he was answering questions. And inside of that, you will find all kinds of interesting things how Jesus sets the record straight. Let's go on to the next slide tonight. Thank you so much. Logos. This is a Greek word. I do want to say, let me get a swig. Ah, don't you wish you had one? <laughs> I'm not a Greek scholar. I can read Greek fluently, but I don't know everything that I'm reading. Um, I have a decent uh, Greek vocabulary. Hebrew is my field. Uh, I'm just uh, enough to be dangerous in Greek. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a verse of scripture that, that we all know very well. It's an easy one to memorize. John 1 and 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So if the word was God, then the Bible says that God was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So the word, now there's going to be a lot of word here. The word for word in Greek is the word logos. Okay. So let's go on to the next graphic tonight and let's look at the definition of logos. So this word is very different than the word word in English. I'm going to lose you here on the words. The word word in English is different than the word for word in Greek, logos. Because you know and you understand the words that uh, I'm speaking because you hear them coming out of my mouth. But if I only speak to you with words that I'm thinking and not the words that I'm speaking, you all, I don't know sign language, but I think you all understand what that means. You all will think there's something wrong with this guy. But there's something different in the word logos in the Greek. It actually means something said, but not just the thing that's said. It also means the thought. So not only is it the expression of the word, but it's also the beginning of the word. Where does every word start? In the brain, or at least it's supposed to. <laughs> there are a few exceptions to that rule. No one here, I'm sure. Don't you start looking around at people in the church tonight. It's by implication a topic, subject of discourse. Also reasoning, the mental faculty, a motive, by extension, a computation, specifically the article in John, the divine expression. This is talking about Christ. So something said, including the thought. This is what makes John chapter 1 so powerful and also revelatory. And this is why John 1 and 1 seems to be a bit of, uh, of a riddle. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So who was the Word? God. The Word was made flesh. So it tells us, really, we can understand very clearly from the epistles that He was the express image of God. Where is an image? It's talking about the imagination or the thought it started here, comes out here. That's what words do. Well, guess what? He started there, and then in Bethlehem, he was born into this world, and thus we got the express image of the invisible God. Church family, that is the difference between our God and the gods of this world. In this world, there are Lord's many, lowercase l, and God's many. But to us there is but one God, one Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we serve. Okay, let's go on to the next uh, slide. I've already quoted this, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things, uh, such like things do ye. So I get the idea that when Jesus was actually saying that you've made the, the word of God, I, I get an idea that he was kind of going like this. You've made the word. I don't think he was holding up a Torah scroll or something like that saying you've made the word of God of none effect. I think he was, he was trying to let them know you've made the word of God of none effect because of your traditions. You said Messiah has to come all the way over here. You said he has to come all the way over here. And here I am, born of a virgin, a root out of dry ground, here I am, conceived of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, here I am. We know that he got hungry on his mother's side, but he fed the multitude with that divine spark of godliness, the father side that was in him. We understand the dual nature of the Messiah, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. So I want to, uh, to go on to the next slide. And I want to talk to us tonight about the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Now, 
I want to uh, put a bit of a disclaimer, I guess, out here, or maybe not, not really a disclaimer, I guess, but something that I think every one of us should know. I think that we should know how to say the name Jesus in Hebrew. Once again, this is another one of those points that if we don't know it, there can be some things that are kind of murky in the scripture. Now, I am not saying, and there are some people that do, there are some people that do espouse an idea that we should only use the name of Jesus in Hebrew. I don't subscribe to that, and there's a reason why. Because the Bible doesn't say it's about how we pronounce his name. It says it's through faith in the name. And I wanted to bring this up to you uh, tonight to help you with this point. First of all, there are behind me four, you can see Jesus there in English, but you can see four ways that in first, Macy, in first century, rather, Judea, Messianic times in Judea and Israel, these were the four ways that the name Jesus was pronounced. We have it in all the primary sources. It's recorded in history. So we pronounce the name uh, Jesus in Hebrew as Yeshua. Yeshua. Okay? Now, Yeshua is actually not the full pronunciation of the name. Because the name is actually the exact same as Joshua. So when you look at the name Joshua, it's actually Yehoshua. That's the full form of the name Jesus is Yehoshua. Okay? But in the life of Jesus, he would have been called Yehoshua, Yeshua, Yeshua, Ishoa. Somebody's repeating after me. Praise God. They're trying to learn this thing. All of these different pronunciations. He was called all of these names in his time. And we have nowhere where he said, that's not how you pronounce my name. But this is where Hebrew is powerful. We should know how to pronounce his name. It's okay to use the Hebrew. I mean, we sing songs and use Hebrew words and things like that in it all the time, don't we? Uh, like El Shaddai and so forth. And, and uh, he is my provider. Okay, he is, he is my, my Yire. We say Jaira in Hebrew. There's no J in Hebrew. It's, it's Yire. He is my healer. He is my Rafa. We use all of these, na these words all the time. So understanding the name Yeshua is in incredibly important. Uh, there... Maybe in his time, he was called often in the Aramaic, which is Ishoa, uh, in Aramaic, especially the Peshitta Aramaic, which is even another dialect. So all of these dialects existed in the land of Israel during the times of Jesus the Messiah. So I want us to look at something in Aramaic, if we could. Let's go on uh, to uh, the next uh, slide, please. This is Acts 2.38, as you have never seen it before. I got my Aramaic Bible out and typed out the exact Aramaic translation. Aramaic is a sister language of Hebrew, and it is believed that actually many of the New Testament books, we do have them in Greek, but there's some amazing scholarship going on right now. It's actually showing several books of the New Testament were not first penned in Greek. They were first penned in Aramaic. Now, when we look at this, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, I want you to pay close attention to the words. Shimon, which is Peter, Simon, Shimon said to them, repent and be immersed. Well, that's important, isn't it? And it would be sprinkled. It's not there. This is one of the oldest translations of the Bible. Be immersed, each of you, in the name of Master, and this YHWH is called the Tetragrammaton. We call it in scholarship, 
It is essentially, and maybe you've seen it before, sometimes they use a J instead of a Y, but I don't use J whenever I'm using Hebrew because there is no J. This word you probably already know because you use it every church service when you say hallelujah. We all know that. So this is actually talking about it's a reference to the Lord. Sometimes it is in one syllable, ya. Sometimes way is also added to the end of it, and we get the uh, tetragrammaton. Uh, sometimes uh, we pronounce it as Adonai or as Hashem because this is considered the unpronounceable or ineffable name of God. But here it says the master Adonai Yeshua for the forgiveness of sins that you may receive the gift of Ruach HaKodesh. So this is interesting. Acts 2 and 38 in one of the oldest translations of the Bible actually says Jesus is the Lord God. You never see the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, in reference to anyone but the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's never there. In fact, every time, every time you read in your Bible and you see the word LORD in all caps, it's the Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, the yud heh vav -Hey that we read in Hebrew. That's the four letters in Hebrew. Here, there are, there's, there's no room for misinterpretation about who Jesus is. Here it says, the same Lord that Moses spoke to, this Y-H-W-H, is the Yeshua of the New Testament. This is one of the oldest translations. This is the Aramaic translation of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Church family, when they baptized in the name of Yeshua Mashika, they and that's Aramaic for Jesus the Christ, we say Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew, we understand. They knew exactly who it was whose name they were baptizing in. That the same Jesus name they were baptizing in was the name of the same God that Abraham spoke to. The same God that spoke to Moses from the burning bush. Never says baptize in the name of the second person in the Godhead. It doesn't say baptize in the name of the junior God that the witnesses, the JWs. Come on, somebody. I can't even say that they're a witness of the same God that I am. I'm, I'm a witness of that God. Come on, somebody. He's no junior God today. He's not a prophet like the Mohammedans call him. We're talking about God manifested in the flesh. That's who we're talking about tonight. All right. So I'm going to uh, pick up the pace uh, very, very quickly here. And I want to point something out to you. We're going to backtrack, but that doesn't mean that we're going to take another. It, I'm just, I only need another hour or two. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, we're going to go back there, and I want us to see something. Let's go on to the next slide. So here's some Hebrew for you with some arrows, and those arrows are there intentionally. So this is Genesis 1 and 1 uh, in Hebrew. And Hebrew is read from right to left. So if you're not confused yet or not confused enough yet, I'm going to mix it up for you right here. So from right to left. So the first word is Bereshis, second word bara, then Elohim, and then the two-letter word et, Hashmaim, and then back down to the bottom line, et ha aretz. I want to talk to you about the smallest word in Genesis chapter number one very quickly. And that is the word et. Just after the word Elohim there, the word et. Two letters there. The word et has confused rabbis because there is no interpretation for this word, no translation. It's an impossible word to translate. My students, uh, this blows their mind every semester. Because they're like, so there are words in Hebrew that, are, that we, can't, we can't even translate in English? I said, no. We can't translate this word. Uh, it, it, is, it is impossible to translate with just one word. It has to be explained. 
So this word, et, is actually spelled amazingly with the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph and Tav. So this is important, untranslatable. You can't translate it. The only way we can really properly translate it is with an arrow, in fact, a two-sided arrow. We could translate it with a symbol, but not with a word. We don't have a word in English that is an equivalent to this. So the rabbis and the big scholars of Hebrew have said, this is one of those, it's, you know, it's confusing, it's out there for interpretation, it's, it's a difficult one to understand. But this word is now translated by some rabbis as the word for word, talking about the word of God. Not the word for word, but for the word of God. Why? Because it is the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So they said it's just a symbol for the word, for the word of God. Because it's like saying A to Z. Oh, I like that. They said it's the bookends of the Hebrew alphabet, so let's just... Let's just use the word. Let's say this is, this is a symbol for the word. But what was this word doing? It's connecting God with heavens and earth. As if to say that God was coming from the heavens to the earth. Now this is an interesting point. Because the symbols of the Hebrew language did not start out looking like this. The symbols of the Hebrew language, amazingly, started out kind of similar to hieroglyphs. The first letter, Aleph, started out looking like a bullock. That was the symbol of the Aleph, a bullock. What symbol could that stand for? Well, we know that on the Day of Atonement, what was the first thing that was, and that's Yom Kippur, what was the first thing that the priests offered? They offered a bullock. Very important for the Day of Atonement. Now we do know that the lamb was also, uh, was also sacrificed and the blood was sprinkled upon the mercy seat and all of that. But to cleanse the priest first, the bullock has to be offered. So what does the bullock represent? It represents purification. But the first symbol for the letter Tav was a cross. A very interesting point. Because this untranslatable word that points from God to the heavens and earth is a representation of purification, sacrifice, and ultimately redemption. That's what the old symbols, and we call it proto-Sinaitic forms of these letters, that's what they used to look like. Now today, when we look at this, we've got a whole lot of what seems to be circumstantial evidence that seems to be pointing in a direction. And now when we have so much of this evidence, we need to come up with a verdict. And that is, first of all, this word is un untranslatable. But when you and I look at it, from where we're standing backwards, it makes sense to you and I. Because we see it's all about sacrifice. It's all about strength. It's all about purification. It's all about sacrifice and redemption. But what we also understand in this amazing small word is that it's the first and the last the beginning and the ending in fact when we read in the Greek it says alpha and omega which is the first and last letters of the Greek but would who would have thunk it that we could give the same example in the Hebrew that our great God and Savior Jesus Christ is also the Aleph and the Tav 
He is the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. He is the sacrifice for all of humanity. And he is the same God that left the heavens, came down to earth, and became a propitiation for our sin. Church family, this is the God that we preach. And so this is why I believe very strongly the first messianic prophecy is not in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 15. That is a messianic prophecy, of course. But I believe that this was the first messianic prophecy written in the word of God. On to the next uh, slide. Yes, son of David. We're getting very near to the end here. So, son of David, Psalm 110, verse number one. We've all been asked this question before. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110, verse one. How many times have we been brought to this verse of scripture, pastor? And when we're brought here, they say, look, two lords. This is talking about the father and the son. Two, separate. David pointed out, the Lord said unto my Lord. Well, that's a very interesting point. And it's also a very fair question. Was he talking about two lords? Well, first of all, and I inserted it uh, parenthetically for you here. We have the Tetragrammaton, the YHWH. So the first Lord that you read in this verse will be in all caps. In your Bible, you look, it will be in all caps. The second Lord will not be, and that is Adonai. So the first Lord is talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he said, said unto my Lord. So he is taking possession. This is, a, this is a personal possessive form of Lord when he said Adonai. And so he says here, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So we have two questions here. First of all, two lords seem to appear here. And then the next thing is the right hand of God. So oftentimes we're brought to verses of scripture like this in both the first as well as the New Testament about the right hand of God. Let me set your mind at ease very, very quickly with regards to the right hand of God. First of all, the word hand is not here in this verse in Hebrew. And also... Amazingly, it's not there in any place in the Greek New Testament verses of Scripture either. When the Scripture talks about the right hand of God, saw Jesus sitting at the right hand of God or standing at the right hand of God, the word hand is not there. It only says the word right. Well, amazingly, in Greek, the word right also is the same as in English. Not the same pronunciation, but the same meaning. Right can refer to a direction, or right can also be like, I've got the right to freedom of speech, like your Bill of Rights, the right to bear arms, or the right to remain silent. I guess that depends on what kind of citizen you are. So it's a very interesting thing we read about. When we read the word right hand, we always just go, straight to the side. It's talking about the right hand side there, but the word hand is not there. It's not there in Psalm 110. It's not there in any places that are referring to what would seem to be in our Trinitarian friends that would say it's talking about the right hand of God, the right side. So you have the father here um, who kind of looks like Gandalf, and then you have the son over here that looks like hippie Jesus. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? But that's problematic in both the Hebrew and the Greek because the word hand is not even there in those verses. What was the scripture saying when it said that Jesus was there sitting at the right, uh, the right hand of the throne of God? It was actually saying in the Greek that Jesus was rightfully sitting in the throne of God. That's the interpretation that we get. So the very same situation here now. Understanding this point is incredibly powerful, and I think that everybody needs to understand this. But let's look at these two lords. First of all, it's very easy to understand. We have to know who David is. David, it was prophesied, would be the king of Israel, and it would be through his loins 
that the Messiah would come into the world. So when David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, he wasn't talking about two different lords. He was talking essentially about two different uh, designations. First of all, the Lord said unto my Lord, the Lord that will come through me. There is a Lord that is going to come through me, not a second person. We have already established that. There is a dual nature to the Messiah. But he said, the Lord said unto my Lord. Now, when we read that on the surface, it is very confusing. What's he talking about? I tell my students all the time, if you ever find a verse of scripture in the Bible that seems to be confusing, I promise you there will be another verse of scripture in the Bible that will help you connect the dots. And wouldn't you know, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, let's go on to the next verse of scripture. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Listen to what Jesus said. This is in your Bible. It's written in red. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. You see, we read the book of Revelation wrong. And I'm not going to get on pre, mid, post, tribulation stuff. All of those things we can find in the Word of God. Yes, it's about end times, the book of Revelation. Yes, we, we understand that. But the book of Revelation is not a revelation of the end times. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's how the book of Revelation starts. If we want to know who Jesus is, we can find who Jesus is in the book of Revelation. So he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. All of our Trinitarian friends will say, yes, he's the offspring of David. We understand this. But what about the root of David? The only way he can be the root of David, if he was the first Lord that David wrote about in the 110th Psalm. The Lord said unto my Lord, the Lord that will come through me. I am the root, Jesus said, the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Church family, the God that you and I are serving today, He is not two, He is not three, and wouldn't you know it that there are some people from the Vatican that are wanting to introduce a holy quartet and get Mary into the mix as well. They said because Mary is a co-redeemer equal with Jesus because when Jesus was crucified, she felt pain as a mother, and so because she felt pain in her heart, she as well felt pain for our sin, so she should also be worshipped as co-redeemer. Heresy! Apostasy! Not on your life. I'm going to worship the one God of Israel. Now here's the reason why knowing the name Jesus is important in Hebrew. Let's go on to the next slide. Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 14 and 15. We know this scripture. God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said thus, Uh, Shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And then here he, in verse 15, he actually gives us the tetragrammaton for the first time. He says, I am the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc. He says, this is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. So when he said, this is my name forever, that word forever comes from the Greek or from the Hebrew word that is translated in English as forever. The word all generations here in Hebrew, in English, would be translated as all generations. No tricks in the Hebrew here. When he said, this is my name, Moses, for all generations, I've been asked the question many times by students and friends, I've debated with. He said, this is my name unto all generations, yet today we say Jesus. But here it says something very different. The next slide, please. I am that I am is pronounced in Hebrew, Yasher Hiyah. So in this, what do you hear? Yeah, Asher, Yah. I am that I am. 
Have you noticed ever in Genesis chapter number 3 in your Bible, I am that I am is in all caps? Do you know why that is? It's giving a tip of the hat to the word Lord. Like the word Lord is in all caps, the reason is because you get the word Yah in this verse. So I am that I am is here in all caps for that very specific reason. Lord God is pronounced Yah and Way Elohim. The name to all generations. So this is why we need to know hallelujah is praise the Lord in Hebrew. So when we understand this point, now we understand when he said all generations, God said, this is my name unto all generations. Well, we better know what the name is. So let's go on to the next slide. Only got 50 more slides. No, I'm teasing. We're about done. Brother, can you just start up here and just read those names for me, can you? <laughs> at the top. We'll wait. We'll wait. Go, go ahead. Can you read those? You, forget you. You, you, you. Somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody needs to get him some horn rims or something. Anybody else read, read that up there? Compound names. No good. No. These are the compound names by which God is called throughout the Hebrew Bible, along with their references. You didn't know that because it's just a little bit of white up there. But these are the compound names. There's a name for all kinds of the virtues of God by which he is called. Sometimes God is called Yireh. Or Jaira, as we say. Sometimes he's called Rafa. What, is, what does Yire mean? It means provider. What does Shalom mean? It means peace. He is our peace. Sometimes God, uh, because the Bible says God is love, in Hebrew, sometimes he is called Ahava. In Hebrew, which means love. He's actually called that. He is called holiness. He is called banner. He is called victory. By all of these names, he is called these compound names. Okay? And that's all great. And it's great to sing and use these names in Hebrew. It's great to sing about El Shaddai, and it's great to sing about all of these things. That's, that's wonderful. But there's something that's incredibly important for us to recognize tonight. We can sing about these names. We can preach about these names. We can teach about these names. But the Bible tells us that God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. So you see, when we talk about the name Jesus, which is actually just another compound name, Yahshua, it means God saves or God is salvation. That's what the name Yahshua means. It's just like the other compound names of God that are all listed right here. And I hope you're writing these names down in your notes. The name Yahshua is just like these other compound names in so many ways. But this is what the scripture declares, that God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. So it's not talking about the name George or Jeremy or some other name, what the scripture is declaring is that the name Yahshua, the name Jesus, is above every compound name by which God was called in the Hebrew Bible. It doesn't mean that those names are pointless and powerless and don't have great revelation in them. We understand that. But you see, the reason why the name Jesus is the name above every name, all of these names, is for this simple point. Because when you needed peace before, 
you called out upon Adonai Shalom, my God, my Lord, who is peace. If you needed healing, you called out upon Adonai Rapha. If you needed something from God, you called him Adonai Yireh or Adonai Jireh, as we say in English. But today, when you need peace, you say the name Jesus. Today, when you need healing, you say the name Jesus. Today, when you need provision, you call out on the name Jesus. God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in the heavens, things in the earth, and things under the earth. I'm thankful today that my knee has already bent, that I've already bowed and confessed that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So let's stand to our feet tonight. Last slide. is a Hebrew name that means God saves. And when we look at this, as the scripture declares, this is my name to all generations. When you see the name Jesus in Hebrew, the name Yah is still there. It's still present. Not talking about a second person, but talking about the word that was made flesh and actually dwelt among us. For God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. That's talking about the same Jesus, the same Yeshua that I'm preaching and teaching to us today. So, I hope tonight that maybe I've helped to answer a few questions for you. I hope tonight that it is clear that if nothing else, I'm a one God apostolic preacher and teacher that I believe this message. But I hope that I have encouraged someone tonight. If you have not yet been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, this is the reason why. This is the reason why we insist on baptism. By immersion in the name of the Master. The Master, Adonai Yeshua, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ye shall receive the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Ghost. This is the God that we serve today. Who has given us a very clear, encapsulated plan of salvation in one verse of scripture. Bringing home all of the verses before it. That's the organization of our God. He's not the author of confusion. And so tonight, I appreciate every moment of time that you've given me. I appreciate what I feel in the house tonight. And this same God that has saved us in the beginning. It was in his mind all the way back in Genesis 1 and 1. Guess what? You and I are still on his mind tonight. He's still reaching for us. And he's chosen us. And he wants to equip us so that we can reach out to more souls before his soon return. So can we lift up our hands to the Lord tonight? Can we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Can we worship the one tonight who in him there is no, no variableness, there's no shadow of turning. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the same God who was and is and is to come. He is the same God who became a, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. He is the root and the offspring of David. He is the bright and morning star tonight. That's it. Let's worship him in this house tonight. Let's just call out on the name of Jesus in this house. If you need something from him, if you need healing, if you need deliverance, if you need provision tonight, he's here and he's given up that name that is above every name. Come on. Let God do a work in our hearts tonight. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, call on his name tonight. There's wonder working power in the name of Jesus. Aren't you glad you know who Jesus is? The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
He's everything we need him to be tonight. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you've not been baptized in Jesus' name, now's a good time. Tell somebody you want to be baptized in the only name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. The name of Jesus. You had received the Holy Ghost. It's a good time to receive it right now. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, pray, God, open your understanding oh, to the truths of the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to live by your word. Obey your word. Oh, yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Hallelujah. 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 Don't forget Sunday morning service, Sunday night service. Maybe you can bring somebody with you and hear some more good word. Enjoy some more good preaching and singing and feeling the spirit. Bring somebody with you. God bless you, men. Don't forget Sunday morning uh, men's breakfast and all the other things that go along. God bless you. Be safe in Jesus' name.